percent. So let's wait a couple of more minutes for more people to join. I guess we have part participants from different time zones. And anybody can say hi on the chat with their countries so that we can know which countries are listening to us. Yeah. So let me start. Welcome to our third Kegel Days Meetup Istanbul event where we have two special guest speakers, well known as uh, Dr. Jean-François Pouget and Gilberto Titeris. And hi, CPMP and hi, Giba. Thank Hello. you so much for joining. And Hello. I want to use your Kegel usernames if you don't mind, because it's easier for me to pronounce mm -hmm. as a Turkish it's guy. Fine. Yeah. It's fine. It, it's an honor for us to have both of you at the same time in our meetup. Oh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And I would like to thank Ahmet Erdem, who invited Giba and CPMP and made this meetup happen today. For those who don't know Ahmed, he is the tur first Turkish Kegel Grandmaster and who is cu currently working at NVIDIA with Giba and CPMP. And before coming to my questions, I want to tell the outline of the meetup. And first, I will give a brief information about Kegel for those who have heard about it for the first time. Then uh, I will start our panel discussion, which will take almost an hour. Then we will have a 30 minute of Q&A session, and during the meetup, you can always ask your questions using the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen. And please do not forget to send it to all attendees uh, so that every can, everyone else can uh, know your questions. And please send your messages on chat, and uh, please do not forget to send it to all attendees. So Kaggle is the largest data science platform ever where you can join competitions hosted by companies, universities, and research institutions, and so on. And you can find thousands of public data sets for your interest and research areas. And you can play with notebooks shared by highly talented data scientists around the world. And you can participate in discussions about the competition or anything related to Kaggle or data science uh, in Kaggle forms. But more importantly, you can meet with highly qualified data scientists around the world like Giba and CPMP. And for example, I had a chance to team up with Giba in a competition which was University of Liverpool ion switching competition. It was a very nice experience for me uh, to work with Giba. So these are the main factors uh, that make Kaggle best data science platform ever. So after this brief introduction about Kaggle, um, Welcome, I want to welcome again Giba and CPMP and thank you very much for joining. Most of us know you very well because you are the most famous people on Kaggle, but uh, can you please introduce yourselves with some details about your backgrounds, your careers and current jobs, and uh, finally your study, stories to start Kaggling. And we can start with Giba or uh, the order is not, doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, I, can, I can start. First of all, thank you, Emin, for the invite. Also, another day, another time on the Kegel's Day. It's an honor for me. And also, I enjoy every opportunity to talk about data science and especially about Kegel in my previous career. OK, if you don't know me, I am Giba. Uh, but my name is Gilberto in Brazil. Uh, I am an electronics engineer. I worked for many years as an uh, engineer before uh, turning to a data science scientist. Um, I worked for companies like Siemens uh, and Petrobras in Brazil. Uh, but since I found Kaggle in 2012, I started to learn data science and I, I got addicted. Uh, there are two things in my life that I love. One is electronics and the other is data science and machine learning. So since I found Kaggle, uh, I, I never stopped learning. I learned for, from Kaggle, I, I learned from papers, from the internet, from other people. And uh, also, uh, 
when I switched to data science, I, I worked for Airbnb for a couple of years. And also I, after that, I joined a small startup called Oppo that uh, do automated machine learning. And right now I'm working uh, for NVIDIA as a data scientist, uh, working for the Rapids team, trying to, to promote Rapids and uh, everything related with data science and GPUs. Uh, okay. Uh, about Kaggle, uh, I, I started Kaggle in 2012 and I have competed in more than 150 competitions since then. I won some competitions, I, I lose other competitions, but every time I join in a competition, I learn a lot. And this is very important. Join competitions not only for, uh, for, for fun or just to see what, what's going on, but taking into in the mind that you are going to join a competition to learn. And if you spend some time in competition, you will learn a lot, a lot, because uh, sometimes just uh, reading papers or get the fundamentals about data science is not enough to, to learn and to fix that on your mind. But competing, coding is the best way to learn. This is my opinion, and this is the, how I learned from Carol. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for the introduction. We can come to CPMP. Um, CPMP, I would say what uh, these letters mean in a while. I started uh, my professional life. I wanted to be an academic. Uh, I was good at mathematics and science at school. Uh, and I, I, I got a PhD in machine learning um, in previous millennium. Uh, so it was interesting, but nobody cared. It's very different from now. So after my PhD, I say, oh, I want to do something that is useful to the world now, not in uh, I don't know when. So I went to a startup and in the startup, I started uh, a new activity, which is constraint programming. So developing a, a software to solve con uh, business problems that are constraints and then evolved to math programming, which is a, a, a related field. Now it's called mathematical optimization, but CP means constraint programming, MP means mathematical programming. So that's my, where my name comes from. And uh, in that startup called Dialog, uh, I created a team uh, and I was a technical lead and manager. And we were doing R&D publishing papers. Uh, I gave some keynotes in uh, AI conferences like each guy or triple AI who are the top conferences a while ago before deep learning. Then I stopped and uh, about at the same time, because I was not in academia and being in industry, but it's not like now where uh, Google or Facebook people publish a lot, but it was a bit hard. So I decided to stop this academic activity and concentrate on uh, useful stuff. At the time, our company was acquired by IBM. And at IBM, I was asked to move uh, again to machine learning given my background. But to be honest, having a PhD from 10 or more years ago is not useful in machine learning. You need to get up to date. So I looked to places for places where I could be up to date. So I took a very nice course from uh, Andrew Ng and Coursera that I recommend, machine learning, not deep learning. I looked for Stanford machine learning course on Coursera by Andrew Ng. It's it's the best I know. It gives a good uh, good uh, foundations. And then I I said I need to practice, and I found Kaggle. So it was four years ago, and I started competing uh, in exactly the same mindset as Giba or Giba uh, learned. You know, so I said, oh, you will see. I'm a PhD in machine learning. You will see. You will see. And in my first competition, I was like 100th on the public leaderboard. I said, oh, not too bad. And when the private leaderboard came, I was, uh, I dropped 2,000 ranks in my first competition or second, I don't remember. And this gave me a big lesson. I said, okay, I'm doing something wrong. I'm overfitting. 
I need to understand. And uh, given it apparently to me, I'm quite good at avoiding overfitting in Kegel. I'm surviving shake up uh, quite often um, because I was burned very hard. And it's good if you go on Kegel, the one thing you need to learn is how to not overfit, how to evaluate your model properly using the training data and the public leaderboard so that you don't drop in the private leaderboard. So, uh, and I was hooked after two competitions, even if I had a bad uh, result, I was hooked and uh, I, I competed more and more, found a way to link this to my job at IBM. I was working on machine learning tooling. So I said, well, we need to know how machine learning is used uh, by competing on Kaggle to know what tools people need, like supporting XGBoost. And uh, six months, uh, well, eight months ago, I saw a job, uh, a job opening at NVIDIA for Kaggle Grandmaster. So I tried. And uh, here I am with Jiba and uh, Ahmed and others. And we're having fun, but we work quite a bit as well. I took one day of vacation in six months. And that's a problem when your hobby becomes your job, right? You can't stop. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. I will try to address my questions to one of you, but any one of you can jump in and add whatever you want to that question. And my next question is to Jiba, and you joined 180 competitions and you won 54 gold medals, and which means such a crazy effort and time spent on Kegel. So what was your path to becoming number one in these competitions and how long did it take to reach this? Okay, actually, it was a long time for me. Uh, I joined Kaggle in 2012. Uh, but I remember the first competition I joined in Kaggle was uh, wins for casting, and I took a top three uh, final, final ranking on that competition. So I got very excited for my first competition in Kaggle and winning the third position. And uh, this makes me uh, start to learn other tools. For example, I started to learn R at that time and then Python. But I remember the first two or three, the first three years is what was just a learning ex experiment for me. It took three years to get to the top 10 on Kaggle. And I, and I remember that at that time, I was competing in almost every competition available. Of course, at that time, it, it was easier to win a competition in Kaggle because there, there are not many competitors, like high-level competitors like we have right now, nowadays, in Kaggle. So it was easier to, to win a competition before. But it took three years to get a top 10 on the Kaggle Global Ranking for me. But in those three years, I learned a lot. I learned, uh, I, I started from MATLAB, I learned R, then I learned Python. And I learned some tricks about validation strategy. Uh, I developed my own way to do stacking. Uh, it was a long path for me to get to the top. And I was searching in my Twitter account today the, the exactly day I got in the number one on the Kaggle leaderboard, uh, let me check here again. It was in October of 2015. So it, it took almost three or three and a half years to get to the top of Kaggle. So it was a, a long, long way and I remember I, I, I stayed on the top for some years. I don't know exactly how, how much time, two or, or more years, but there's, a, there's that uh, uh, exponential decay uh, equation on Kaggle rankings. So every day you, you lose some points you get from the competition. So to keep on the top, you need to keep competing and keep winning competitions to, 
to keep on the top. It's pretty hard. It is. It's. Uh, you need to have to be very dedicated to Kaggle. We spend a lot of time on competitions. So I, I believe I have proved my point uh, on being the top for a long time. And, but it, it, it's not easy, right? It's not easy to, to get there. Uh, don't expect to, to get there in less than one year. But the good thing about getting on the top of Kaggle uh, global ranking is you, you learn a lot. You have the opportunity to team up with great people. Uh, you, you learn the most different challenges in terms of data science and machine learning. You can learn different algorithms. You can improve your coding skills, uh, how, how to work in a team. Uh, it, it's a long, long, long journey, but it's very valuable for everyone. If, if it's trying to get on the top. Uh, I believe anyone that got on the top 100 of Kaggle is someone that is deserving some time of the life to, to competing on Kaggle and spending a lot of time in competition. So uh, top 100 on Kaggle for me, it's a winning already. You don't need to be on the top one, uh, but top 100 is also winning in my viewpoint, of course. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your answer. So you highlighted that it's not just for ranking, it's uh, only for learning, yeah. So my mm -hmm. next question is to CPMP and you have almost 300 gold medals on discussions and which shows your effort uh, you put in this community. I'm grateful for your contributions and to Kegel because I know it's not just for medals and upvotes. We can, we can understa understand this when we look at the content of what you are sharing. And I, my question is that what was your path to becoming number one in discussions and how long did it take to reach this? And do you think that you can take the first place from Chris in the next months or years? All right, so it took me two years. So within two years, uh, I became number one and I stayed there for two years. Till I lost uh, recently to my colleague, Chris Dioti. And um, first I like to write. I used to have a blog and before, as I said, I published uh, scientific papers. Because when you write to explain stuff, you, you understand it better. So uh, as Jiba said, coding and ID is a good way to understand it fully. Explaining it to others is also a very good way to learn and understand. So if you do both, you code and you explain it in writing, then you, you really master uh, whatever it is. And um, so I like to do it and uh, I was sharing and my take in, um, you know, there is a saying uh, where it is better to teach people how to fish rather than give them a f uh, some, uh, some fish, right? Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do in Kaggle. I don't spoon feed people. I'm sharing ideas or hints or directions, but people always have work left to do. Uh, and I believe that's the best way to teach people. Um, and with this, and also after each competition, I share what I did. And I believe this is the best place to learn is after every competition that you enter, spend time reading what other people share. That's where you learn the most, I believe. And uh, that uh, brought me at the top rank within two years. Um, then I stopped a bit because when you share a lot, you help your competitors. And I know of several competitions where I disclose some insights and that prevented me from uh, from performing better, uh, maybe a, a prize or a gold medal. So I stopped a bit and also Kaggle was starting competing with IBM. So I was, uh, now that I'm at NVIDIA, there is no compet compete issue. So I'm, I'm back in discussion on notebooks and contributing more. Taking over from Chris, um, he wrote a lot 
he's a good teacher. He likes to teach. So he's explaining a lot of uh, elementary stuff that I don't want to explain anymore. So he, he gets, but he, now that he got the top spot and uh, he's, he's four time, uh, four time grandmaster, I guess his next objective would be to do well in competitions. And for this, he needs to share less. So if he shares less, he would get less votes and maybe I will catch up. But I don't yeah, care can. if I'm not the uh, top uh, anymore, if it's a colleague who's in front of me. I will fight if uh, someone <laughs> comes from behind, not from NVIDIA, that's for sure. Okay, thank you so much for your answer. And my next question is to both of you actually, and any one of you can start. Uh, how are you motivating yourselves to compete on Kaggle for quite a few years? What's your main motivation to be on Kaggle for a lot of years? Uh, I believe my main motivation, I already answered, it, is to learn, right? I think my main motivation changed over the years. Now it's to learn. I, I joined Kaggle for fun. Then I, I found that I, I could have fun and learn at the same time on Kaggle. And once I got to the top 10, my motivation was to get to the top one. <laughs> on the Kaggle global rankings, right? And once I was on the top one, uh, actually I changed my motivation. Since then, I was doing Kaggle uh, mostly for to learn, to learn new tricks, to try new new, new strategies to solve the, the problems. And I keep learning every day. I think it's, uh, there's no one in the world that knows everything. You are learning every day. I am the same uh, step. I, I'm learning every day, and I learn since then. And I keep motivating doing Kaggle, mostly because of learn. Of course, there's some fun also doing Kaggle because it's a competition environment, right? It, it's inevitable. But most of uh, of uh, my motivation is to try new tricks and learn and learn. Yeah, it's an experimentation platform, right? Kaggle. Uh, above all is an experimentation platform. You can experiment uh, in new, new tricks. You can try papers. You can try your own crazy ideas. Uh, you will, and you will learn at the same time. This is what motivates me. Thank you. I, on my side, first, I must say I admire Jiba because he's entering almost every competition and doing well in most of the time. For me, it's harder. I, I prefer to do one at a time. Uh, regarding learning, there is a revolution that happened in Kaggle over the last two years. It's deep learning. And if you look at who was at the top of Kaggle two years ago, say in top 20 or top 10, and now there are only two people who survived. It's Jiba and Casanova. Uh, all the other guys who are experts in XGBoost and stacking and assembling and blah, blah, are gone because they did not learn enough about uh, deep learning. And I must say, I'm trying to survive by learning deep learning as much as I can. So, uh, and that's the motivation is in, in Kaggle, if you want to stay uh, at the top, you need to master every new technology that comes. So, uh, and when we say deep learning, it's different uh, between NLP with transformers models and image classification with uh, CNNs and object recognition, which is yet another, and uh, representation learning and other uh, uh, landscape uh, competition like this, and reinforcement learning. And uh, I'm sure there will be a cool new stuff. Uh, for instance, a GAN competition uh, soon or whatever. So it's an endless uh, stream of challenges. And if you do spend time on it, it's the best learning uh, source I know of practical machine learning. So it's not research. Even if we innovate in some of the solutions, it's, but the goal is not to publish a paper, right? It's to, to make good predictions uh, on a challenge. So learning. And uh, there is a, even if there are less uh, tabular data, uh, XGBoost competitions, 
there are still a big, uh, a, a big variety of, of problems on Kaggle, so it never gets boring. I think the only risk is burnout <laughs> because it's so <laughs> addictive. Yeah. We'll see. And you seem very addictive to Kaggle, both of you. And my next question, and you team up with together uh, in a couple of competitions, and one of them was Microsoft malware prediction competition, where there was a huge shakeup on private leaderboard, and you were almost uh, the only team that's surviving from the shakeup, and the other teams on top of the public leaderboard felt hundreds of places on private leaderboard. And it was mainly because of the difference between the train and test data sets. So my question is to CPMP, and what can you suggest to do when the train and test data sets are very different, like in this competition? First, and what you, was, yeah. Yeah. First you have to recognize that there is a difference. Uh, so this is a time series prediction. So time series are always very tricky. It's easy to overfit. But here uh, it was uh, uh, very challenging because it, it was about to, to predict if a given uh, Windows machine uh, PC would be infected. And uh, the, train, the, the test data was in the future of train and there were major OS version introduced and major antivirus uh, software introduced, etc. So a lot of changes, and some of the test data overlapped with train. And I was very wor worried that, especially at the time, uh, from uh, my experiment, what worked best was XGBoost. And XGBoost is great, but it does not extrapolate uh, extrapolate well. And uh, the test, the train data had very little, uh, very small number of recent machines. So for XGBoost, all recent machines were being together, but the bulk of test data was on uh, these recent machines, which means that the bulk of the prediction and test data was made uh, based on a very small number of trend data. And I found this to be extremely dangerous. So I said, I need to create my binding myself. So I process the train data by binning, not binning, sorry, binning uh, values, for instance, OS versions. Uh, if there was an OS version uh, that was uh, very, uh, with very few train samples and a lot of test samples, I was just merging it with another value that is close to it, where you had a lot of train samples. The goal was to avoid uh, any feature where some value had a huge number of test values and no, uh, almost no trend value. So I spent my time, uh, yeah, I remember I did it the first week I entered the competition and created my own data set. And then I was struggling because on the leaderboard, I could never get better than the 20th rank. I, don't, I didn't know, I could not. And in fact, I could not overfit to the data because of my binning, but I didn't know. So it was a huge surprise uh, when the, we saw the private leaderboard. Um, to, to limit risk, so Jib also had uh, other techniques to avoid overfitting, maybe he can describe as well. And to limit risk, we deci decided to blend a large number of models, which is always a, a safe approach. And we ended up like sevens. But looking back, my first models on my uh, new data set, I think eight of them were better than the winner. Uh, so the, the lesson is really try to understand differences between trend and test and uh, assess if they are uh, relevant or, or not. So now it's called adversarial uh, validation. Uh, people often publish notebooks in every competition about it. Sometimes it does not matter, but here it matters a lot. And uh, I must say, if people have not met and not teamed with Jiba, you should because he's one of the nicest teammates I ever saw. So he, he's, he's, he's good and he's good to work with. Jiba, if you have any uh, want to add, you can add to that competition. Uh, thank you, Jean-Francois. 
<laughs> it was great to team up with you also. Yeah, I, I remember that competition was really hard to set a good validation strategy. And early on the competition, we found that the, the public and the private leaderboard is going to be different. Even, even from this from the start, we are working on trying to find some ways to validate that that uh, data set. And as far as I remember, we tried many validation methods, and we we are, are not able to find any strategy that relates well with local validations and public leaderboard scores. So for our final submission. Remember, we blend different validation strategies. We blend a, model, a, a, a neural network model trained in one specific strategy with a gradient boosted decision tree trained in a different validation strategy. And also, uh, of course, we, we are since the beginning of the competition trying to not overfit the public leaderboard and generalize as much as possible. But also, uh, I remember I built some features that are stable over time. For example, I used the train set to find features that don't degrade the prediction quality over time in the, in the future. So it was very important also trying to find good features uh, that generalizes well in the future. And yeah, of course, you have to, to have some lucky also on the, on the end, but I believe setting the validation strategy is the most important thing uh, in a competition. Because if you don't set the, the right validation strategy, doesn't matter which model, which algorithm you, you use to solve the problem, it won't work. So validation strategy is the first thing you must uh, think when you join a competition or try to solve any data, data science uh, challenge in the real life or in the Kaggle, doesn't matter. Validation strategy is the most important thing. And find a way to validate your models and compare results with your teammates in Kaggle or on the real life is uh, a good practice to do, right? So there's no uh, recipe how to do, uh, how to define good validation strategy because each data set is different and probably each data set you have different strategy to, to define. There's no perfect validation strategy, there's no uh, uh, default strategy, but the thing is you, you, you need to try to mimic as much as possible the real world. If, for example, you are trying to predict the next week in the future, one week ahead, try to build your validation strategy, also predicting one week ahead. And so as much as possible as you mimic that behavior, the test set behavior in your validation set, it, there's more chance you don't overfeed it, your results. And you also team up on favorite competition, which was a time series competition. Maybe you mm -hmm. can uh, give some examples about your validation scheme on that competition because uh, you jumped a qu quite a few places on that competition, as far as I remember. And what was special about your solution in that competition? Uh, if, if I remember correctly, that competition uh, was more than three and three years ago. Uh, please, uh, John Francois, correct me if I'm wrong in anything, but I believe our solution was pretty similar to, to Microsoft. The only difference, we, we didn't uh, change the, 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 the features on the test set, but we blended different strategies to try to avoid uh, overfeeding and survive to the shakeup. Uh, I remember on Favorita, uh, it's a time series also, data set. Uh, it's a big data set. We have data since 2012. And there are a lot of uh, stores and items in time series in, uh, separately. So the idea was pretty similar to malware. It's tried uh, to predict each time series separately, but how do you 
to validate that data set that makes the difference, right? So we mimic the leaderboard uh, uh, strategy. For example, in, in this favorite uh, uh, competition, first you have, you have the test set, then first you have the public test set and later the private test set. So there's a gap between the train and the private test set. So it's important when you validate your model, also mimic that gap in your local validation strategy, right? If you have one month gap between the train and, and the private test set on Kaggle, try to mimic exactly the same behavior on the train set. Leave one month gap between the train and the real validation data, right? So if you, if you are able to mimic it as, as uh, uh, correctly, then you, you increase our chances to done over PD to end results. Also, it's very important uh, when, you, when you try to solve a time series problem, don't use uh, early stopping in any model that, like gradient boosting or neural network. Try to don't use much early stopping for each fold individually, right? Try to, to train it maximum number of trees and uh, compute the overall score over all the folds you use on the validation set. Uh, it's important in the time series, especially if there is a pattern or trending on the data, right? If you do early stopping on a specific fold in a specific period of time, you are only overfitting to that specific period of time. And it's, it's, you are not generalizing in the future. But if you do early stopping, and all the validation periods at the same time, then it's the best uh, scenario to avoid overfeeding. And this, this is a, a, a general uh, a general technique to avoid overfeeding on time series data, right? Try to set up a big period for validation and avoid using early stopping in specific folds. Yeah. Uh, I want to stress one point uh, Giba mentioned. Some people, mo a lot of people forget that the goal is to have the best private leaderboard score and mm -hmm. not public leaderboard score. So, and in many times series competition, you have the, if you uh, order by time, you have the time, the training data, then the public test data, then the private test data. And if, so as Iba said, there is a gap between the end of train and the start of private data. And you should design all your cross-validation faults with this gap, if possible, even if you lose data, because it, it does not matter if you have a bad public score, because uh, you are, uh, only train your model to predict beyond the gap. And that's what we did in, uh, in Favorita. Uh, and I believe a lot of teams in front of us were just tuning for short-term prediction to look good on the public leaderboard. And we tuned for longer-term predictions. Um, because our models are not very different from other teams as far as I remember. So the difference is really on, uh, on what we use to tune. Actually, we like public leaderboard more more often than private leaderboard because it's, it seems cool uh, during the competition. And you mentioned that you applied ensembling uh, in some of the competitions because it's very common in Kaggle, but it's not uh, very commonly used on real life projects. And we like also uh, stacking in Kaggle very much. And my question is to CPMP, and can you tell what's this, what's stacking and what's the correct way to apply stacking without uh, right, uh, information leakage? This question is a trap because without a drawing, explaining stacking is very difficult. Yeah. But basically, um, so that there is a good, uh, a good a paper in Kaggle forum, uh, Kaggle blog. So if you Google it, you would find it. But the idea of stacking is to train a set of models, say Exibus, Neural Net, uh, GBM, which is a similar to Exibus, uh, some uh, linear models, logistic regression, whatever. 
And you need basically to have one great model and then you need to have other models that are different. Maybe not as good, but different that learn something different. And then you use the prediction of these models. So that's the first level as new features. And you train other models using these new features, possibly with the original features or just with the new, new features. But really the idea of stacking is to create new features by using models to predict the values of these new features. So where it is tricky is you need to be careful not to leak the target value. So you, you must not uh, uh, train models on the same data that was used to generate the feature. So it's a bit tricky. Uh, the best way uh, is to do nested cross-validation, but that's very expensive. The next best way, and I know not everybody agrees, but you, you use k-fold cross-validation. So for each model, you train k model, and you, you just keep the prediction of this k model for each of the k validation faults. And then you train again uh, the second level uh, model using the same faults. If you don't use the same faults, you're leaking target information and in general it backfires. And also uh, when you do this, you should not use early stopping in the first level because uh, it leads to overconfident predictions, overfitting to the validation fold and it backfires uh, when you stack. But that's the idea. So. Stacking is just using the predictions of models as feature. Um, very often stacking overfits. It's, uh, it's very powerful, but it's tricky. But sometimes it really boosts your performance. And, uh, and it was uh, the secret weapon with target encoding uh, two years ago. People mastering this were in top 10 in, in many competitions. With deep learning, stacking is much less popular. It overfits yeah. very often. I'm not sure why. We have a question about stacking from the audience. How do you choose the level one and level two models in general? Um, so if it's a, a, class, a binary classification, I always run ridge regression as stacking, as one of the stacking models. So it's, it's logistic. Uh, not rich, yeah, logistic regression with a strong regularization. If it's a regression problem, uh, I would use rich. Um, so a linear model always. The, the first form of stacking is just averaging the prediction of your models. That's one stacking in a way, uh, but a very, it's a very simple uh, second level model, take the average. Then you can train a linear model, that's the next step. But you need to have uh, have a lot of regularization, and then uh, I try XGBoost. I try a small MLP, so uh, dense neural network. Um, that's what I'm. These are the three I start with, and then mm -hmm. uh, something I did not use much, but which is very useful is extreme. Um, whatever the random forest, but uh, more randomized. Uh, extreme trees from a psychic term. Uh, it's quite effective at stacking as well. Mm -hmm. I, I want to add something. Uh, for me, there's no receipt which models you need to use on first or second level of a stacking. But what stacking looking is looking for is for diversity, right? So you can have diversity changing the algorithm you use to train a model, for example, use a neural network or a gradient boosting or a linear model. This is one way to, to, to give diversity to the stacking. The other way to, to give diversity is to changing uh, the data set, the feature engineering use it for each data set. So you can combine models, different models and different data sets. And usually, uh, I use some algorithm to choose which models are good for the first or the second level of stacking based on the performance when combining those models. For example, if I can build a model and add to stacking and find that 
it decreases the overall performance. So probably I will just discard that model, not going to use that model on stacking. I can use like a forward selection of models in a stacking, right? So there's no receipt, but uh, the idea is if you add a model to stacking and it improves the overall performance, then keep that model on stacking. That's the main idea. And uh, yeah, you're right. And also as a side effect, each time you train, you, you use cross validation, save the validation predictions, the out of fault prediction, always save them in addition to saving the model itself because you will need them to stack and you don't know in advance which one would be useful. So save them. That's a mistake I've been doing in my early competition, not saving them. And then you can't stack. We are getting out of questions about stacking and for uh, CMPs, CPMPs uh, advises, uh, we have a question. What's the difference between nested cross-validation and within fault, uh, k-fault cross-validation? Oh, yeah. so in each, so in k-fault validation, you use k different train validation split. Um, then the idea of nested cross-validation is to run cross-validation inside each of the training faults. Uh, this way, uh, uh, you never uh, use the validation data to predict anything on the validation data. So it's a bit tricky. Um, it's a, the right way to do target encoding, for instance. Uh, each time you, you, you are at risk of leaking target information, this is a, a secure way. Uh, but it's expensive because instead of running, uh, say, five train uh, with a five fold validation, you will run 25. Um, so it's, it's quite expensive, but it's safe. Okay, thank you. So my next next question is to Giba, and I know it's again hard to tell verbally, but can you describe how to do target encoding properly without overfitting? Because uh, it's again another uh, issue that's very common in uh, Kaggle. Mm -hmm. When we have a lot of, uh, when we have some categorical variables with high cardinality, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, targeting code is very tricky, and I see a lot of people doing it the wrong way in Kaggle. Uh, why? Because you use the target uh, target variable to to encode one categorical feature, right? So basically, it's a model using only one feature. We are modeling one one feature using the target. Right, so if, if you do that uh, for each categorical feature in your data set using different folds, you are leaking uh, the target between folds, so it's not good. Uh, also, if you do that using a simple K fold, as, as said before, also you can leak the target information between folds because first you convert, you use the target to convert each categorical features using target values, then you train a model using that, that value. So you, you find out that you are leaking the target information between the folds, right? The right way is using the nested fold cross-validation technique. So one cross-validation inside a cross-validation. So first of all, you, you uh, split the da data in K folds, for example, five folds, then for each one of these folds, you pick the train part and do a, 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 a target encoding only on the train part, using only information from the train part of those folds, right? So using only four folds. So basically, if you do the target encoding for each one of the folds separately, there's no way to leak the feature. This, this is the right way to do the target encoding. First, you split the, the folds and do, then process the target encoding for each fold separately. There's no way to process everything on the beginning and then train models. No, this is the, the wrong way. You, you leak the target. The right way is first you split the folds, apply the, the proper uh, target encoding for each fold, 
train a model, then split the folds for the, the next uh, iteration, apply the target encoder and train a model, do it k times or five times, and then you are fine. But just make sure that you are doing it inside each fold, right? This is the right way to avoid the indication. Mm -hmm. So my next question is just for both of you. I think it's getting harder to create a reliable validation strategy on special deep learning competitions because we have large data sets and which are more common nowadays. And how do you build a reliable validation strategy on large data sets? And uh, when you have limited time and resources, I know you have uh, NVIDIA GPUs, but I think of you if you were us uh, with no GPU and think that we are using only Kaggle kernels. Uh, maybe I will, I will start quickly. Um, the goal of cross-validation is to evaluate your models. Uh, if the data set is not too small, you can train your model on all the data using cross-validation and use those models to make the test prediction. In a very large data set, what I do is I would sample the data set, do cross-validation on the sample, find the right model, the right architecture, the right uh, hyperparameters, and then uh, train on all the data. Uh, if you cannot afford training on all the data more than uh, uh, a few times, uh, you should not waste those time to tune your models. Um, you know, if you train on a, all image nets, you don't tune on all image nets. Uh, it's just taking too long. Yeah. If you are dealing with a big data set like image classification, uh, and you don't have much resource available. Uh, I would say sampling the, the test set is the, the best, sampling the, the validation folds, the best way to do that. But take care to sample with the same distribution as used in the test set, right? This is the best way. The problem uh, in some recent competitions in Kaggle is that we don't know exactly distribution of the test set. Uh, it can be an issue. So I usually spend some time trying to figure out the distribution of test set. If something changed in the test set, at least the public test set, right? And if, if I found via experimentation that it's similar to the train set distribution, then it's fine. It's fine to sample uh, some some rows on the validation set to, to validate the results, right? But the problem is to, to define if the distribution is the same or not, and try to adapt the distribution of the test set to your train set validation folds. This is the, the, the main issue, but I don't see uh, just sampling some rows, a subset of the validation as an issue. Of course, you, you get a little bit of uh, variance in the results of folds, but it is it, it's not going to affect much your results if you are sampling from the same distribution. Yeah, in the recent competitions, like uh, we have a lot of code competitions that we cannot see the uh, test set. And mm -hmm. yeah, th this is, this is the, the, the most difficult ones. We don't see the test set. We have no idea about the distribution of the classes. There's, there's a, a classical way, uh, a more conservative way to approach that problem is try to uh, use a, 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 the same distribution for our, all the classes, right? Uh, this is the most uh, classical and conservative way don't change the distribution, uh, taking in account that all classes have the same distribution and change the distribution of the train set to make that in account or try to use exactly the same distribution the test set and make two experiments. One with uh, equally distribution classes and the other one with target distribution classes and see how which one uh, performs better on the leaderboard. This is just an example of how you can experiment which one uh, uh, use for your validation. But of course, as I, I said before, Kaggle is an experimentation platform, 
and you must get use it with that kind of experimentation. You can use even the leaderboard to experimentation, right? Uh, if you don't, uh, you you can trust some uh, some experiment using the leaderboard scores, right? At, at some level, of course, to avoid trying overfit the public leaderboard. But some experiments are valid using the, the leaderboard, and every competition I try to spend some time just experimenting on the leaderboard before de defining a good validation strategy. Uh, I, I try to don't trust much on the forums or the, the, the high performance uh, Kaggle notebooks uh, to avoid some bias and overfeeding bias on the public leaderboard. It's important. You prefer to discover the data by yourself, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very important. One step of the data science is get comfortable with the data. Understand the data and get comfortable working with the data. Yeah, this is one part of the data science. Uh, regarding a nested cross-validation and target encoding, we have a question from the audience. How do you call, calculate the feature for the test set? Do you simply average all the target encodings for the test set or is there something advanced technique? There are many ways to do target encoding. You can just calculate the average of the target by each category. Uh, you can calculate uh, like a standard deviation of the target or the, uh, the minimum value of the target for regression, the maximum value of the target. There are infinite ways to do target encoding. For a, for a binary classification, I recommend one uh, is just calculate the average of the target or calculate uh, a mean uh, average of the target based on the how much frequent uh, each uh, category appears on the data set. For example, uh, you have a, a categorical feature with two colors, red and blue. Red appears only once in the data set and the target's one. And blue appears 100 times and the mean average is 0.99. Which one is more uh, confident, right? Which one? The, the blue that appears more on the data set or the red that appears only once? So I don't trust much the red uh, value of the target because it appears only once. So I uh, give more weight to, to the other category that is more often on the, on the leaderboard. You can do some weighted average also based on the frequency each category appears on the data set. This is for a binary classification, but you can apply targeting coding for regression as well. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I wonder your main roles and tasks uh, on Rapid AI on NVIDIA, and we have some questions about the same thing from the audience. And, uh, and what's your main job uh, in NVIDIA? Is it really like, joining competitions or uh, do you have any other tasks on uh, Rapids AI team? Um, our, our day job is to compete uh, and uh, gain a mind share for NVIDIA this way. So it's really uh, what we can spend all our day on it if we want to. But at the same time, it's difficult to just do competition. It looks fine, but it's exhausting. So we're also helping, giving feedback uh, to other NVIDIA teams on products. Like there is a new version of Rapids today, and it includes some features uh, that uh, we started or, or we gave feedback on. Uh, we also are working on some machine learning problems for NVIDIA. Uh, some forecasting or other problems. Um, but yes, it, it looks like uh, a dream job. Uh, we are kind of professional competitors, but we no longer have the excuse to not have time. You know, before, at once I could say, oh, I, I could not spend much time on this competition, blah, blah, blah. Now, uh, <laughs> if I don't do well, it's because I don't do well. You know, you buy you have a different view. Don't you yeah. think that it's unfair to us because we don't have any media GPUs and we don't have much time like you? 
Well, at the same time, I, I won uh, several prizes earlier this year with my PC and the 1080 Ti. So, yes, having lots of compute resource can help, but I, I would not say time is more important, I would say. Yeah, the same here. I think how much time you spend uh, on the Kaigo competition it will be proportional up to your rank on the final leaderboard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, how much speed up do you usually get with Rapids AI uh, libraries? Do you have any success stories using Rapids? Rapids, or uh, how mature currently is this product? Mm -hmm. I can I can talk about a success case using Rapids. Uh, we. We made a team in any video on the last Rexis uh, challenge, and we won the challenge basically using the Rapids tools. It's our, our best uh, uh, case using Rapids to win a competition, right? Actually, we use a QDF and QML uh, to speed up our pipeline because the last Rexis competition uh, they provide a big data, big data set with more 2 million rows, around 3 million users. So it's a, there are a lot of high cardinality categorical features. There are also text features of the tweets. And it, from, the, from the beginning of the competition, I found that it took a lot of time to process using just pandas, uh, to process all the features, to tar some targeting coding, like high level targeting coding on that. Uh, data set, and when you start using Rapids, uh, we are able to improve the speed just switching to Rapids by around 28 times faster, just switching. So we have that advantage. We, are, we can make experiments around 30 times faster than the other competitors. So trying new features, training models, and and all the data science pipeline. So it, it gave us an advantage on that competition by using Rapids. And at the same time, we made some experiments after the competition and using other uh, Rapids tools, for example, uh, using multi-GPU um, and using clusters to process the data in parallel, we are able to improve by almost 300 times the speed of the computation from from the from the raw data to a prediction, right? It's extremely fast, and yeah, this is the the, the best case we had at Nvidia. Jan, it was very famous in trend, trends competition with Ahmed's notebook, as far as I remember. He shared a notebook on support vector machines, which are working on uh, QML uh, library that you have? On, uh, so I know that Kazuki and Odera on, on this Rexis competition that Jiba mentioned, he was working, uh, he had a, a CPU server he was using for his Exibus model and it, it was taking two days to train. And when he got access to NVIDIA uh, DGX machine, he moved to Rapids and Exibus and GPU and uh, the two days became 20 minutes or half an hour. Yeah, that's it. Uh, so it's, it's uh, so it's, and uh, he, he, he went from like a 40 or 64 CPU machine, it's not, um, so speed up can be very, very big. You ask mm -hmm. about maturity, uh, Rapids and implement a subset of pandas and scikit-learn at this point. So I would say that's the main limit. Uh, sometimes you don't have a GPU accelerated version of uh, what you use in pandas or scikit-learn, but the team is uh, adding, the goal is to replicate all uh, pandas and scikit-learn. So, it will come. If you see an algorithm that you would like, like to see run on GPU, just go on rapid GitHub and uh, create an issue. Uh, 
that's the most effective way, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to add, uh, the Q, QDF is equivalent to Pandas and QML is equivalent to scikit-learn. Actually, it's a, it's a subset of each one, right? Uh, when NVIDIA is working to accelerate all those algorithms using GPUs, that's the idea. That's how you can use QDF uh, very, in a very similar way as you use Pandas, right? But with the advantage of uh, processing everything in parallel using GPUs, that is the advantage. So you can get, have a, a, a big boost on the, on the performance just using uh, Rapids, M2 from Rapids. And from my experience, I've seen the, the speed boost depends on the size of the data set for all these algorithms. For example, uh, we made a lot of experiments for using nearest neighbor on GPU compared with CPU, uh, SVM, uh, graduate boosting using extra boost. Uh, and it depends, really depends on the data set. Usually for small data sets, the difference is not so big, but if the data set starts to grow more large, uh, GPUs have an enormous advantage in terms of speed if the data set is, is big, right? Uh, for all these algorithms, I've seen performance improving improvements in the, in the order of 100 times, 200 times, depends on the data set, but it, it, it's, it's enormous, usually. I will start to ask the questions from Q&A session. And the first question was, can CPMP give his book with a, with a draw? Uh, I didn't know you have a book. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm a co-author of a book yeah. uh, that uh, I'm co-author because uh, uh, quite a lot of the book content came from my blog, but I didn't write the book itself. So some colleagues of mine at IBM uh, were writing a book and I recognized content from my blog. So I asked to have my name on it. <laughs> um, well. Send me a message on Kaggle and do that I'm interested. Um, yeah, that's his book. Did you see? Yeah, great. I have to, but I don't know how much it is. I'm not sure it's uh, oh, $17 still. Yeah. I don't know if it's uh, if it's worth uh, reading. If For people who read my uh, blog, you won't, you won't learn much. Um, okay. We got the answer, yeah. So the next question is uh, your thoughts on how long it might it might take a decent practitioner working in the field to go from zero to top 100 these days on Kaggle. I think it's related to give us advice. Oh, that's a good question, but I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many things to learn and to try. Uh, I would say maybe you can, if you are very dedicated, maybe you can do it in uh, one year. It's my guess, right? If you're dedicated to learn from zero to one top 100, maybe one year, it's, it's fine if you're dedicated enough. John, I know, want to add something? As I said, <laughs> uh, uh, with the planning, it's very different. So we do see people a lot coming from China or Japan who immediately do well the, on the first competition, they enter on Kaga and they get into top 100 in one or two competitions. Um, I was puzzled. And in fact, it's because there are competition platforms in Japan and China that are not the Western people can enter, but you know you have to read Chinese, which is not obvious <laughs> for us. Yeah. So we we so for people who are who are experienced competitors in these platforms, entering uh, top one hundred on Kaggle is easy. For someone uh, uh, starting really competing on Kaggle. it will depend on uh, how much time you spend. Uh, as, as Giba said, uh, the more time, the more effective you are. So, for me, I think it took one year to become in top 100. 
and I was spending, I was working. So uh, I had like one hour a day. It took me one year. Okay, thank you. It's the same now. The next question is, please guide something about new launch lift motion prediction competition to start with. Actually, I don't know you if you had a chance to look at it. What? Which one? Lift motion lift. prediction. It it's launched two days ago. And I I guess you cannot share anything. I've looked yeah. at the data. Yeah. It's uh, it's uh, there w there never was a challenge like that on Kaggle. Um, the only remotely, uh, very remote one was a track ML where we had to predict trajectories of particles. Um, but here it's it's uh, people and vehicles and what have you. You have to, to predict future trajectories from uh, what you observed in the past few frames. I think I will enter, but I've, at this point, I have no idea. It's It, it started yesterday or, or the day before, so it's really early. Um, but it looks uh, like a very interesting uh, problem. I think you can start your startup uh, if you have a, a good solution to this competition. Mm. Yeah. Autonomous vehicle, it's... It's challenging. NVIDIA is very active on it. We have a very strong team um, working on it. But they will not enter this probably because and they don't want to disclose what they do. Okay, the next question is to uh, CPMP. What should we do if in image classification our training accuracy is worse than our tra test accuracy? There is no problem with local data, but with model generalization, there is a huge issue. Train accuracy is about 57%, uh, but the accuracy of the test data is around 82%. But when it comes live uh, with real data, it behaves very poorly. So, uh, well, I don't know it's, why it's for me and not for Giba, <laughs> yeah. but my clients. You know, Giba said something essential. Whatever you do, to validate your model, you need to be as close as possible as the real world use case for your model. So in this case, if you have a, a 80 plus validation, 82 uh, accuracy on your test data and you perform um, bad in, uh, in the real world, it means your test data is not representative. So, the problem is not your model. The problem is your test data. Try to find better test data. Data. That's what I would do. Okay. The next question is a very good one. When you start a new competition, there is usually a lot, a lot of domain knowledge involved, such as astrophysics, finance, biology, etc. How do you learn and understand the mid-domain knowledge for a new competition? And how do you connect the domain knowledge to the problem you are solving? It's for both of you, actually. Yeah, actually, it's a very good question. Uh, if you take a look at Kaggle history of winners in the competitions, you say that most of the winners are like generalists. They are not experts in the in the top of the competition. And I believe there is a reason for that, because uh, generalists tend to try everything to solve that challenge, to, so, to, to, to solve that with the machine learning or some other algorithms. And the specialists or the experts, in, in the, uh, they, they come biased by some solution. Of course, there are exceptions. Uh, where uh, specialists wins competition, of course there are, but most of the time generalists are winning. And my approach for that is reading papers and at the same time try crazy ideas, like doing experimentation. Uh, reading papers helps to understand uh, 
the topic of the competition, right? Try to find something on the internet, not only the papers, but something using Google. Uh, but doing a lot of experimentation helps. I mean, uh, uh, learning from your mistakes, right? Uh, for example, astrophysics, I know nothing, and there are competitions some time ago about that. When I try some crazy experiments, most of my experiments didn't work it as expected, but some of them worked very well. And I tried to combine them that, that ideas in a better models and better algorithms, and also try to, to blend with some ideas from some uh, uh, state-of-the-art papers and, and try also my own ideas, right? That, that's that's the, the the logic behind trying new things. Uh, I, I believe Kaggle is about experimentation and, and that helps. And, uh, and this, uh, it, it happens sometimes that especially when, when it's a research competition. So one example was uh, the plastic competition where it was about diagnosing uh, future simulated uh, uh, space uh, light source or well, classifying them into various types of supernova and the winner was a student in uh, astrophysics but he won because he had a good grasp of machine learning what uh, what i found and i agree with Giba often top cagglers beat a specialist and uh, this this because uh, the specialists don't have a good grasp of machine learning uh, and it's harder to get a, a good grasp of it than to get enough uh, knowledge about the technical domain for instance uh, uh, when it's tabular data you know state of the art until last year, people who were using random forest in academia uh, when we use XGBoost. Um, and for so, and now we look at uh, we use state of the art uh, uh, neural networks when uh, people may be stuck to uh, state of the art from three, four years ago. I believe Kaglers are better at moving to the last state-of-the-art technology. There's a related question. And why does linear models are always, always uh, good at perform, performed by trees? No. Even, <laughs> <I'd>, <laughs> even That's when not my, true. Yeah. yeah. That's not true. In, uh, <laughs> in, for instance, in, uh, in Kegel had a set of COVID uh, forecasting competitions. Yeah. And in week four, I had one of the strongest models, uh, which was just linear regression. And I've, uh, I've beaten ensemble of XGBoost and neural nets and blah, blah, with teams full of uh, Kaggle Run masters, just with linear regression. So it depends on the size of data. In, in this case, data was small. Uh, we have few, at most, uh, 100 points or so in time series. Um, so when you have small data, uh, simple model perform well. If you have uh, billions of data, complex uh, neural nets uh, perform well. So this question really depends on the size of data you have. But linear regression can just be the best model. It happens. Okay. Do you think a neural network model should directly predict a confidence value along with the expected target value or the confidence value should be derived from the target prediction intervals? It's a bit long question. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, actually the question is asking if it if it's better to use a neural network to predict the confidence, uh, term, yeah. confidence interval and the expected target value at the same time, right? And yes, it's perfectly possible to do that. 
And also this is the, the right way if you need uh, a confidence interval also. Use the neural network to predict both. Okay, and uh, people interested in that, uh, the week five of COVID forecasting and one of the M5 competitions, the participant were required to predict confidence intervals. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn about, and uh, for instance, Ahmed used the neural network, Hiba used XGBoost. Uh, I saw, well, a lot of different models can be adapted to generate confidence intervals. And we had a M5 competition for yeah, predicting that, confidence yes. intervals, yeah. The next question is, uh, in which specific cases is better to do nested cross-validation? Uh, there is no specific case. Nested cross-validation you do when you, you want to avoid overfitting between folds. For example, as I said before, targeting code is a good example of using nested CV. Or if you want to do a stacking ensemble, and be sure that you there is no uh, leakage between folds. Also, nested CV is necessary. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, best guess: convolution one D finds chain of uh, website visits and is position invariant. I believe that's uh, because Actually, someone be. asked me why I use the yeah. one-dimension convolution uh, in my last layer of my web traffic forecasting model uh, and I don't remember. So okay. uh, I will answer, well, I need to look back at what I did. It was my first neural net ever. So I learned Keras at the time. Um, I don't remember. I would say, uh, I don't know. So I, I don't remember, frankly. I don't remember. Okay. The next one is a good one, I guess. Can you share any instance when you created your custom objective fund according to your business objective at your, at work? Yeah, I can I have uh, some examples. When I, when I worked for Airbnb, I was, I've been working for a search ranking team and we had a, a custom metric on inside on that team. And we were, were uh, uh, the only way to solve that metric is to change the loss function of the XGBoost and the deep, deep, uh, deep learning model we are using by that time. Uh, another example was an M5 competition that when we had that crazy metric, I tried to change the custom uh, function, uh, the loss function to match that metric. Sometimes, it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, but yeah, it, it depends on your necessity. If you need to do that, then usually it's good to do. But it depends on your metric. Okay, thank you. The next question is how, uh, how to team up with any of you in future competitions? How do you accept team ups with other Keglers? I think you uh, got removed from s some of the competitions, like toxic comment classification, right? Because yeah, of the toxic. dual account issue, yeah. Yeah, we teamed with the wrong guy. <laughs> yes. And we got removed after uh, getting a gold medal. It was not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's good to... Uh, for now, uh, yeah. my side, uh, I try to team only with one person at a time um, because I tend to join competition a bit too late, so I can't spend time uh, coordinating too much. Uh, if I know the people, for instance, we team Ahmed and Jiba, uh, we know each other, so uh, we, we are efficient, but with new people, you know, I've teamed, uh, I entered a team, someone uh, contacted me to team, I say, yes, yes, I will team after my competition, and when I team, we were five, he asked a number of people, five in a competition with three submission a day, 
it was uh, it was not effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually uh, I team up with people that I already know, already team up in the past. Uh, mostly because uh, I know how how the the the, the, the people working in the past, how, how is the way of working a team? I used to, to team up with people that I already know. Okay, thank you. The next question is, can you suggest any platform except Kaggle to improve ourselves? I think Kaggle is the best uh, platform, but do you have any other platform? If you, if you read Chinese, uh, Kenji. So if you read Kenji, uh, you can enter uh, Japan or China competitions. Um, they, they have quite a bit going on there. But if you don't, I believe Kegel is, uh, is, uh, is the best. Yeah, um, I think so. I've been searching in the internet uh, some couple of weeks ago about other competition websites and I found that there are many competition websites and some of them even have the same uh, same appearance as Kaggle. They try to be similar to Kaggle also. So I still find that Kaggle is the best one because it, there are more visibility in the world and there is much stable platform also, the, the kernels, uh, the notebooks are very good. You can have access to GPUs, CPUs there. And usually the prices uh, are, are uh, higher on Kaggle than other platforms. But yeah, I would recommend Kaggle. And if you like some other topic in other minor platform, also I recommend to join and try to learn. And Kaggle has the power of Google actually. Yeah. yeah. I will ask the last question because it's about the uh, end of the meetup. Do you guys apply stratified A fault with, an, with any medium important categorical feature on a regression problem or prefer to do stratified of bins of target variable? I can uh, repeat the question again. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got it. Actually, I, I, I do both. I try two experiments. I try to uh, stratify by some important feature, and I build an experiment doing that. I try locally in the leaderboard, then I try them also by beans of the target variable. Yeah, I try both. And I, I, I keep the one that works better. I think my children, yeah. On my side, I, I'm most of when I just use careful. Uh, I find that even if all scores are diverse, you get a more robust prediction, uh, actually. Especially when, uh, so either your trend data is large and uh, with a similar distribution as test and any any k fold works fine. Or uh, your data is not that big and you have the, you, the, the distribution is not that clear and I'm not sure stratified k fold works better. It looks better in your CV, you have more regular scores among folds, but the end result, I don't know, my, my mind is not set. We answered uh, more than 30, 30 questions, but we couldn't answer some of them. Sorry for those questions, but uh, we need to close the meetup because it's uh, the final time. So thank you so much, Giba and CPMP. Thanks for joining. If you have final words, uh, you can come. If you don't have anything to add, we can close the meetup. I would yeah. uh, just that one. Uh, most of these questions, I would like to answer by just try it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, there is no point discussing it is better or that better. Okay, you can have an idea, but the best way is just to try.
and then you will learn and you will make your own intuition about what works, what does not work. Frankly, a lot of time and uh, can be saved by just implementing two different options and running them. Yeah, I agree. Human intuition is the best tool to solve any problem still nowadays. Of course, if, you're go if you have a good intuition and good coding, coding skills in, in, the, in machine learning, then you can get the best solution. But I agree with CPMP. Just try yourself. It's a good answer for most of the question because data science is about experimentation, right? So if you are a good data science, probably you are doing a lot of experimentation. And have a good intuition in how to use the experiment results to improve further models. This is, this is the best thing you can do uh, as a data scientist, right? And if you, have, uh, if you have one question about which algorithm is better than other, the best answer is try both and keep the best one, right? Try at least two experiments. And you, you, you made the choice, use your intuition, use yeah, the logic you, you can extract from the data. Thank you so much for your time and efforts. And I enjoyed a lot and learned a lot from your uh, talk. I hope we can see you again in the next meetups on different topics if you want. And thanks everyone for joining. I hope you enjoyed this meetup and learned something useful for yourselves. See you in our next meetups and have a nice day for all of you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Emi. Thanks Bye. for the invitation. Thank you Bye. very much. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye.